I am Spencer Linton alongside Jason. You're shortchanging us today. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not. My apologies. I, should, I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't downplay how awesome you are, Jason. This has nothing to do with me. We're a team here, pal. <laughs> This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. Interviews and insight from this week in Cougar Sports. Every Saturday, only on BYU Radio. To lead off, here's the double coverage interview of the week. Our first interview today is with Kai Naku. I spoke to him on uh, advice he has for his brothers and much more. Take a listen. Kai, great to catch up with you at MetLife Stadium as a member of the New York Jets. How would you explain how uh, camp has gone for you as a Jet thus far? Uh, it's good to see you too, and uh, camp camp has been really good. Uh, it's been a grind, you know. That's how camp is, but you know, guys getting after it each and every day, trying to stack days and get better each day. And us as a defense, we're pushing the offense, and offense is pushing us to get better. So it's been it's been really fun, and um, just the the competitive nature that we're bringing to the Jets has been awesome. You're making the transition from safety to linebacker. How do you feel about the transition and changing positions? I actually kind of love it. I uh, kind of wish I was backer a lot sooner, which when I first got recruited to BYU, I was supposed to be a backer, so next time next time we'll get it right. <laughs> but I don't know. The transition's been uh, really good, just learning from the guys in the room, trying to get down the footwork and the reads. They're a little bit faster than I, uh, when I was at safety, so seeing the line and seeing the 300-pound guys coming at me is a little bit quicker, so I got to shoot my hands and stuff. But the transition's been really good and just getting more reps and getting a better feel for everything. So. Where do you see yourself making an impact for this Jets squad? Because I saw you on special teams tonight, along with obviously playing linebacker. Um, I think, you know, I got to be a good uh, will linebacker, sandbacker, and at the same time, I got to make plays on special teams. And I know special teams has kind of been my thing, so it's just go out there and make plays, run and hit, and that's what I do. So, What's it like to have another BYU teammate in Zach Wilson with you here in New York? Uh, it's been awesome. You know, we get to see each other every day, just chop it up a little bit, but say say hi and talk about the Cougs. So it's it's been fun, and I know he's uh, he's out right now and kind of banged up, but he, he'll he'll get back on the field and he'll he'll take care of his recovery like a pro. So we'll we'll be waiting for him back on the field. I talked to him earlier tonight, and we both agreed that as the eldest of the Nakua brothers in the NFL right now, seeking that dream, you you kind of in a way, are, are an example to those guys, but you're, you're the most business-oriented. Would you agree with that? Uh, I would probably say so, yeah, yeah, for <laughs> sure. I mean, once Puka gets there, I'm sure he'll probably pick it up, too, because he's, he's kind of like me, but Saps is the fun and free one, but I would say for sure I'm the business one, but I'm just here, you know, try to help the guy, help them, you know, when they get here. Now Samson's here and just giving him advice this is what I did, you know, these are things that you could do to save your body, you know, get your recovery going. Get, like, that's kind of what I've been on him, is like, take care of your body because this game is ruthless with hitting, each, hitting people. Like, we're flying around, hitting each other mm -hmm. full speed. So take care of his body, take care of his mind, too, and just attacking every day. And Samson's doing a great job over there. I talk to him all the time, so great touchdown, by the way. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was in a meeting room, and I screamed, and everybody's like, what's going on? I was like, don't worry about it. My brother just scored. <laughs> So it was awesome. It was awesome. What advice do you have for Puka as he approaches what looks like could be a breakout season for him at BYU? For sure. Uh, Puka, he knows what to do. And it's, one, take care of everybody. Same thing that I've told Samson. And second thing, go ball. You know, you got to separate yourself from the rest of the guys that are out there, the guys that you're playing with, and bring guys along there with you, you know. He's got a bunch of receivers with him. Bring the young guys up. You know, they can learn from you. They can learn so much because he's been around the game. He's very smart with the game, too. So I told him, you know, do what you got to do. Bring guys along with you because that's going to help, you know, the Cougs elevate, help you elevate as a person. And, you know, I don't know if he wants to coach when he's done, but he'll figure that out when he's done. But he's, he's got a really bright future, and I'm super excited for him. So I can't wait to watch the season, honestly. It's going to be It's going to be amazing. You practiced all week against the Falcons and, of course, Tyler Algier. What's it like when you see – your fellow BYU alumni brethren on the opposing sideline in the NFL. It's awesome to see. I mean, when I saw Tyler out there in practice, I, you know, I'm on the sidelines. It's the BYU right there. It's what we do, you know. It's, a, it's just running, making plays. But I love, I love seeing the Cougs out there. You know, we're going to get a bunch more guys out. And Kalani's doing a great job out there getting the guys in the league. But having the Cougs in the NFL is it's a dream come true for everybody out here. So seeing the guys, always get to see them when we're coming off the field, talk to them, see how the family's doing, see how their body is, you know, because we know how this game is. And it's awesome seeing everybody. 
You've always stayed ready, and, and your path has been one with some twists and turns and winds and some slowdowns, and you know, now you're a family man as well. Yep. Um, how have you been able to balance it all, but you know, stay ready when your name has been called? Because here you are again. Uh, really just my wife. She's been patient with me. You know, it, like you said, it's been a roller coaster, and just sharing with her how I feel sometimes, and sometimes I don't like to talk. She's like, what's going on? But, you know, I got to kind of let her know because I don't want to create tension in our in our relationship. But, like, she's been she's been my rock and just hold me down. And my family, you know, they're all keeping me positive when things aren't as what I want them to be, when things aren't, like, teams getting cut and whatever it may be. But my family and my, my wife, for sure. So, love you, babe. <laughs> The last question for you, Kai. What do you see for BYU football this season? Man, I see I see great things. I see I mean I wish I could be at every game. I hope I can be at every game, but if I'm at every game, that means I don't have a job, so hopefully not. <laughs> but I mean I see them at least eleven wins. So go do the thing, boys. Yeah. Kai, great to catch up with you, man. <laughs> great to see you too. Take care. Kai Nakua of the New York Jets. Great conversation there, Spence. That was awesome. First off, the uh, beard looks amazing. It's great to have two guys on the Jets. Kai has bounced around here and there in the NFL, right? But he's such a good athlete. It makes me wonder if 2016 should have been mentioned in our conversation of great uh, secondaries. Listen to this group. Kai Nakua, Zane Anderson, Michael Davis, all in the NFL, by the way. Micah Hanneman and Dan Gonwoloku. That, that was a pretty good group Woo. there. Woo! That was a loaded group, and that season, Jeremy, you remember, BYU lost four games by a combined eight points, right? I mean, they were in every game. Of course, Taysom Hill and Jamal Williams played a role in that as well, but that, you're right. That was a great defense, and Kai was a big part of that. And I, I didn't realize that he was initially recruited to BYU as a linebacker, and now really? he's back at that original position. Yeah, interesting. He's, fly, he's flying around, man. He's flying around as a linebacker. He's kind of that nice hybrid model. And the, the Jets defensive coordinator really likes Kai. I, I mean, at worst, like, if he doesn't make the 53-man roster, he will, in my opinion, for sure be a practice player and a guy that's going to yep. get called up and play some meaningful snaps for the Jets this season. All right, brother. Let's keep things uh, going with our interview with Tyler Jerk. We literally had to sprint down the uh, – bowels of MetLife Stadium to, to get to Tyler Algier before he got on his bus, and we're glad that we found him. Our interview with Tyler Algier, who, frankly, not, not surprisingly, is certainly grateful to be playing in the NFL and playing his, what he calls a small role. One-on-one -on -one with Tyler Algier. Tyler, um, just got in with a week of practice uh, competing against the BYU guy, Kai Nakua alumni brethren how was the week for you as a, as a falcon and practicing against kai and the jets no sure it was a lot of it was a learning experience for sure you know a lot of learning you know just com competing that's the big thing competing against other people rather than just your teammates so it was good all right uh, another nfl preseason game for you in the books um how would you feel or how do you feel about your progression from from game one to game two and where you are at camp right now i think it's just a learning just keep, just keep stacking the days that's the that's the quote of the year show sure. just keep stacking them and Really just learning from each practice and just make make every rep count. I think that's the big thing. A lot of your BYU brethren are watching you close tonight and um, obviously rooting you on. Had a chance to talk to Zach, and he, he called you one of the best people that he knows. Um, he wasn't on the field with you, but what's it like to, to cross paths with those guys and, and see some, some BYU guys in a game like tonight? No, I think just, uh, just that brotherhood that we created at BYU. So, uh, like even seeing Kai and all that, just um, like I know I didn't play with him, but I've been training with him and all that, and like whenever he was out there. So you know, I think that's probably like the big thing. You know, it's really like as if like obviously we we're not with each other every every day and all that, but I think with that brotherhood, it just feels like it should feel like I haven't, like I haven't seen them. The, you know, you know, you know what I mean, too. Now with the Falcons, as you push forward, uh, what type of role do you see yourself uh, playing for this team this year? Shoot, whatever role, whatever role. Shoot, they have me as shoot. Yeah, I think that's the that's the big thing. Just doing whatever I can to get on the field, whether it's a first down, second down, or even like what I'm trying to progress to a third down back. So you know, just kind of doing doing it all, but you know, just making my way on special teams and all that as well. So now listen, BYU fans obviously are going to miss you dearly. You're not running the ball for them anymore uh, in Atlanta. But what do you see for your Cougars 
in 2022 with Jaron at quarterback and some new guys stepping in and running back. No, I know. No, I'm excited for you guys, shoot. You know, I'll miss Cougar Nation and all, all their support. You know, hopefully they'll stay with me with my journey. But, you know, I'll always be supporting. All right, Tyler, any last uh, message you'd like to send to the BYU football team or to BYU Sports Nation? I'll just ball out, man. I'll be watching you guys. I'll miss you all for real. <laughs> Tyler Algier with you. Hey. <laughs> We miss you too, Tyler. Yeah, uh, and we're, of course, Tyler, we're going to be with you on this journey, which is awesome. I love how raw that was, that you had to run down and get him. Also, he's got the smeared makeup, right, which is part of the deal, the uh, warrior mentality there. Keep stacking days. I think he's doing that. And, Spence, you can read into kind of limited action for him in preseason two ways. I think we read into it that the Falcons really like him. They don't want to overuse him. They don't yes. need to see him a ton. They're going to give him those reps in the regular season, at least as the number two, it looks like, which is super exciting. He, we, it's been a minute, right? We've been watching Jamal Williams, which is exciting. Tyson Williams a little bit with the Ravens and now perhaps the Colts. But it'd be good to have multiple running backs in the NFL, which is something, let's be honest, historically, BYU has not produced a ton of those guys, and now we have a couple in the NFL right now, which is awesome. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, you should see Arthur Smith, the new coach of the Falcons, when he talks about Tyler Algier. Like he, he gets, like I know it's it's a cliche, but like his eyes light up. He gets a big smile on his face. They clearly value Tyler Algier and uh, what he can do. And and I think that we saw a taste of that around the goal line last night. Tyler's just got that ability to just slip through the tiniest of little gaps uh, you know, among defenses and, and just push the ball forward. He rarely loses yards, and they love that about him. I uh, talked to uh, my guy Brett Jukes, who is over communications with the Falcons. He's a BYU graduate. Uh, he's the right-hand man of uh, Arthur Blanks, who owns the Atlanta Falcons. And he says, man, like there's, there's a big reason why we drafted Tyler, and we think he's going to play a massive, massive role for the Falcons this year in their new look offense with Marcus Mariota. So, I mean, Tyler, he downplays. He's like, yeah, let's do whatever they ask me to do, play whatever role. I think it's going to be a bigger role than, than maybe we were thinking as a rookie running back. They, they are very impressed with what he, what he has done this, thus far. And to your point, it's limited in the preseason because he's going to play a lot in the regular season. That was one of our favorite interviews this week. You're listening to the best of BYU Sports Nation. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. You're talking about it, and so are we. It's what's trending on BYU Sports Nation. The Athletic has Kalani Stocky as a Tier 2 or proven goods coach, uh, coach among college football coaches, with notables in Tier 1 like Nick Saban, Lincoln Riley, Kirby Smart, and former Cougar Kyle Whittingham of Utah in Tier 1 among nice. them. What's your reaction to Kalani Stocky being a Tier 2 coach on this list? Well, a lot of it has to go – when you look at this, okay, well, who else is in this? Mm -hmm. Who's in Tier 1? Yep. So you have to put it within some context. When I look at being in Tier 2, I think this is quite an accomplishment. I, I, this, is, this is pretty good territory to be in. If you're Kalani Satake, and look, there, there's the 1A, it's Nick Saban. We know he's ahead. Yep, uh, he's, he's always, he's, he's ahead above everybody else. He's the greatest college football coach ever. Yep. And then you have the Tier 1B, and you mentioned some of the guys that are there. Whittingham being one of those, Lincoln Riley, Brian Kelly, uh, Luke Fickle. Uh, the highest, by the way, of the new Big 12 uh, is is Luke Fickle? Yes, yeah, Cincinnati's been awesome. Interesting. Last they, uh, they had nine draft picks. What's What's really cool about this is the picture that they use to talk about Tier One is Kyle Whittingham. The picture that they use to illustrate Tier Two is Kalani Satake. Only half of that is cool to me. So, well, I'm just saying the state of Utah, well represented oh, in going... terms of hey, the focus of these. How about De we look at the state of Utah? Deseret, what's up? But, look, I love the fact that Kalani Satake is in this group. You're talking about guys, several other Big 12s, with Matt Campbell at Iowa State. You know, 
Let's go Big 12. Dana Holgerson from Houston. Mike Gundy, he's a man. He's 40 he at Oklahoma is, State. How old is he now? He's like got to be 50. 52, 54? I, look, I think this is pretty impressive. And, you know, one of the things that really stands out, they Moral go through. victory status here? They, no, they go through a little bit of an explanation as to why they think yes. all of these guys deserve to be in these certain tiers. And, and this just is what they, by salary. This is what they said about Kalani. He said, quote, he showed some resilience, another agent said of Satake. Quote, they had a wonderful season with Zach Wilson, but they were, again, a really strong team last year. Mm -hmm. I think they're going to enter the Big 12 full steam ahead and instantly be one of the contenders. Very high praise for the program and Kalani Satake. I would love to be uh, for BYU to be a contender next year in the Big 12. I think uh, it's certainly going to be a re rebuild to some degree. The hope is you can plug in excellent uh, backups and uh, return missionaries that have been back a year and other role players who now get their time. Uh, and you, you uh, and maybe Jacob Conover is perhaps the guy. Maybe there's a transfer who competes for that job and or wins that. We'll see what happens. But, yeah, I, I think Tier 2 is probably a good spot for Kalani uh, right there. Um, to get to Tier 1, you've probably got to make a New Year's Six game. Uh, right. That's what would be required, I think. But think about it. Um, Satake, is two, the last two seasons had been incredi incredibly meaningful for BYU football, not only in terms of the actual wins going 21-4, and four, but sort of the prestige and status of BYU. Not only does BYU enter the Big 12 on fire, which a long time ago in 2016 I said, you kind of have to have that validating season recently to just get hot and be extra attractive. Historically, BYU's always been attractive, obviously, as a college football program and athletic department. But the last two years have been honest. Don't uh, have been awesome. Don't forget that in the middle of 2019, Kalani Sitake at two and four that year is 29 and 29 as a head coach. Since that moment, BYU's 27 and six. And that's also the game that Aaron Roderick starts calling the plays on offense. I, I continue to, to preach that from this Rami Umptum that Aaron Roderick is one of the, if, if not the big head coach is the biggest, but Aaron Roderick's one of the most influential pieces of this turnaround for BYU. So tier two is tier two's great. I think that's a good spot. You win a power five league and you get into the top five, two of the last three years. That makes sense for Kyle Whittingham. Um, you know, they, they, uh, get into New Year's Six last year, uh, you know, finally, as a Pac-12 member. And, yeah, that's, that's great. Um, for BYU to continue to evolve, you probably need to the, – the next step in the evolution isn't a continue with 10 wins per, per se thing. It's, okay, you got to have that, like, one loss a year, maybe even undefeated, where you actually get into the New Year's Six. And now that, uh, you know, this, this team capable of something crazy – Every time BYU has finished inside the top 10, Cougar Stats putting this out this, this year, uh, this morning, BYU has started outside the top 20. Yeah. So uh, you're, it's either really good or really bad thing, right? When BYU went 4 or 9, certainly they started outside the top 20. But hopefully BYU can put together a special season that continues to put a stamp on what Klein Stocky and the Cougars are doing nationally the last couple years. Before we get on to topic number two real quick, if you're wondering, we mentioned where you know BYU and Utah were and their coaches in this tier. Uh, Utah State, Blake Anderson coming in in tier three. And honestly – After like one great year at Utah State. Maybe the biggest – Solid at Arkansas State. Maybe the biggest surprise to me, they have Dave Aranda from Baylor in tier three. I don't that know why surprises Dave, me a bit. I don't know why Dave wouldn't be in Tier 2. Agreed. Given, given the incredible defense at LSU in 2019 during the national championship as the D.C., and then, of course, winning a Power 5 league in Baylor. I think Utah is more sustained than Baylor at this point. Baylor has a good history, but Dave Aranda at Baylor is just one good year. So perhaps that makes sense. But, hey, you win a Power 5 league, that's pretty good, man. Like, it might be a sec before BYU gets in that situation. It took Utah 11 years to do it in the Pac-12. All right. Uh, because the word of the day is tears, let's stay with tears as we go to topic number two. ESPN has BYU as a tier six, uh, tier six team. And again, there'll be some context with this because immediately you're probably like tier six. That's really, really low. ESPN has them as a tier six team and a, uh, an under the radar gem. So how would you best describe BYU's outlook this year on the national scene? Yeah, people perceive BYU, mostly, the smart ones, uh, as a top 25 <laughs> team, right? When you look at the first couple of tiers, you go up to tier five. It's like Baylor, Houston, Kentucky, Miss 
Michigan State, Oklahoma State, Wake Forest. Above, Wake Forest quarterback, by the way, out for the year. They're not going to be the same. Tier four, Miami, Texas, USC, right? Tier three, NC State, Texas, yeah, there's not a Utah, lot of di- Wisconsin. There's not a lot of teams. It's not like there's no. 10 to 12 teams in each tier. That's why yes. BYU's down in like six because there's like three or four in each uh, one. Yeah, and uh, to finish it off, tier two, Clemson, Michigan, Overrated. Notre Dame, Oklahoma, tier one's Alabama, Georgia, Ohio State. So six is, I think this is spot on for where BYU probably is. I could see an argument for five, um, maybe even four. Four is probably pushing a little bit. But what we hope is that BYU proves itself to be in tier four or five, if you will. Because what we would love is for BYU to replicate what it did last year, Shep, which is great, great success against the Power Five teams, do better against the G5 teams, put yourself to be – in a position to be in the New Year's Six conversation. I don't need 11-1 and one to be happy. What I need is 9-3 and three in the regular season to be happy, right? 10-2 and two would be awesome. That's the realistic expectation. The dream is 11-1, 12-0. The reality is probably 9-3, uh, and three, maybe even 8-4. and 10-2 and two is the realistic version of this. Very nice. Nice compilation of words there. Um, my initial reaction was under the radar. How can a team that has this much production coming back and it's a top 25 team be under the radar? Now, using the explanation that they give, the reason they're under the radar in terms of being a college football playoff team, that's why they're considered under the radar. Totally. So when I see that, okay, I, I I don't have an issue with that. I can get behind that. In terms of tier six. In terms of tier, well, or whatever, whatever it is. Yeah. I'm, I'm, You're fine with six. I'm more worried, ne- not necessarily the number of the tier. It's what they're categorizing it. So they're saying the under the radar gems. So with their explanation as to for the college football playoff, yeah, I, I can get behind that. Anytime it's just a, a wisp of college football playoff <laughs> right. conversation, BYU something, I go, hey, that's fun to be mentioned. It ain't happening, but that's fun. Near six is the goal for BYU. Why do you doubt? The reality. Why do you doubt? The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. Get caught up in the week in Cougar Sports. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. Google Up Round is presented by Marist, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. The head coach of the Washington Commanders, his name is Ron Rivera, and he said the following about former Cougar receiver Dax Milne. He said, quote, a guy who has really shined, but we've always felt good about him, uh, is Dax Milne. I think Dax has played really well in both preseason games and has uh, flashed in a lot of ways and has gotten our attention. The question is, will Dax Milne be the most successful former BYU Cougar in D.C. this fall? Will he outdo the politicians? Uh, and that post Jimmer. Um, I think he will. I think he'll have a great season. Listen, Dax being on a 53 in the NFL is enough for me. Yeah. Him succeeding is gravy because as an, un- uh, well, seventh round, uh, you know, uh, free, almost free agent, he's been really good. And the fact that he's been able to stay on that team, yep. fantastic. Stay in the NFL, man. Yes, he's going to be fantastic. Yep. He's going to make the 53-man roster. Yep. And hopefully we'll see him make an impact. Even more. There you go. BYU fan at Spidey Y. Stowe tweeted out this picture of his BYU football helmet collection. Is this the best? helmet collection you've seen before? Uh, It is amazing. Um, And I am jealous. It looks like it's like, what is it, under the, it's under the stairs, right? So, and these are mini helmets. Yeah, they're mini helmets. But I don't care. What a a collection. That is absolutely amazing. Every BYU helmet ever. I am green with jealous rage, as Hot Rod would say. Uh, I love that wall. I'm extremely jealous. That is fantastic. Of note, there was a BYU helmet with a little bit of red on it. I know. That happened. Is that in the We believe in repentance. (laughs) Okay, BYU soccer dropped six spots to ninth in the coaches' poll. Too harsh of a drop coming off a victory? Well, the UNC game certainly weighs into this, that's why. Uh, I'm okay with that. Well, was it? Um, (laughs) Yes, technically, but. It wasn't like participatory. I think they were trying that one. Um, yeah, I believe BYU somewhere in more in that range. Number three is a little high for me to start the season. I'm more comfortable with kind of BYU in this spot. Well, look, if they were good enough to start at number three, you get a win and you drop. 
six spots? That seems a bit much for me. Don't schedule Fullerton anymore, apparently. <laughs> Jonathan Slater tweeted the following amazingness. There's a shadow on the Superstition Mountains in Apache Junction, Arizona, that appears twice a year with a massive cougar shadow. This just so happens to be showing up, by the way, on the Baylor week for BYU. First off, one, do you think this is real? And two, is this a sign from the heavens? Um, it is a sign. That is the Beat Digger logo right there on the mountains in Arizona. And if it's supposed to show up the Baylor week, I'm feeling pretty good about things right uh, now. That's a win. That is an unbelievable that's photo. That's awesome. I almost don't believe it. Like, it's too good. The angles are too sharp. The ears are too pristine. I don't, that's amazing. That's unbelievable. Well, what are you saying? Somebody went up there and painted it? Or you say it's digitally uh, put on there? No, they used Microsoft Paint. <laughs> <laughs> AKA Photoshop. How awesome is that? You might, that is, it's unbelievable. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. The best of BYU Sports Nation collects our favorite conversations and brings them to you every Saturday. Joining us now, as our first guest of the day is one of our favorites on BYU Sports Nation, longtime friend of the program. He is the senior director of college football and the NFL draft at Pro Football Network. His name is Cam Meller. Cam, happy football eve of sorts, my friend. We're here. It is. It's football eve, right? Less than 24 hours away. I'm going to have to go uh, say happy birthday to Greg in person. I didn't know. I didn't realize we were in, we were in town for the soccer match tonight. Uh, just in my backyard, the shoe, you know, Ohio State. So I, I might have to go over there and check the game out. That's right. You are in the heart of Columbus. And frankly, not just soccer world for BYU tonight, but college football world. I mean, what a place to be for you. What's this time of year like for you as you mentally prepare for another football season? Oh, it's, you know, it's getting ready, the family life, but it's also getting ready to work the crazy hours. You know, the summer leads four-day weeks, work weeks roughly. You know, you're watching film all the time, but it's nothing really starts uh, until tomorrow, Saturday hits. And it's, you know, you start with game day and then you move on. And it's for me, it's 12 hours at least straight of football from the noon kickoffs. And, uh, you know, I don't I don't call it a night until that final whistle of the Hawaii games. Cam, we got a stock market theme going on today's show. Uh, which BYU player uh, are you buying stock in right now? Right now, uh, you know, just thinking of the stock market for, for chance, obviously, Jared Hall is the easy answer. But right now, Blake Freeland, if nobody knows who he is nationally, it's it's Blake Freeland. You need to know this kid right now. He might be a local star, you know, might know who he is in and around the state of Utah, perhaps. But the, the massive left tackle in a left tackle void that is the NFL. I think he, he is an NFL starter very soon, but also he's a dominant left tackle. And for as big as he is. I don't think people give him enough credit for how well he moves, too. So for me, Blake Freeland, before the national eyes get on him and the draft picks get on him in January, and they start saying, wait, who's this kid from Provo? I think you're Blake Freeland's new best friend. <laughs> <laughs> Cam Miller is with us on BYU Sports Nation. Let's keep the stock theme rolling, Cam. Uh, you mentioned Jaron Hall. You've been high on him for a long time, just like you were high on Zach Wilson for a long time. We think he's going to be late first round, early second round pick when all is said and done. Blake Freeland, who knows how high he could fly. Uh, it just depends on if he can stay healthy and do his thing. But who's the guy that maybe is a little off the board or maybe people have forgotten about that you're like, ah, the stock price is really low. I'm on the long game with this guy, and I think he's going to surprise people by the end of the season. Who's that guy? To me, Keenan Peely. I, I'll start there. I think people may know who he is, but if he stays healthy, I've heard comps to what he means to the defense of a Jalen Petrie from Baylor last year. So if you look at a kid like that who – had Jalen Petrie been three inches taller, we're talking about him as a top five pick because he's got Derwin James-esque ability. So wow. if Peely's getting comps like that, this is not just from scouts in the local area. This is national. So if, if Keenan Peely is, is a 12-game starter, 13-game player, if there's a bowl game at the end of the year, which there should be, uh, we're looking at him sort of, I think right now, get in. People need to pay attention to who he is as well because that's sort of the he's not quite off the radar in the sense that he's you know not played meaningful snaps in his career before but all three facets of defense that he does he does very well when he's on top of his game so Keenan Peely is my guy on that defense right now all right let's look at the futures uh, as we continue with the stock theme as you forecast what's coming 
for BYU in the season ahead. Who are the teams that Cougar Nation should be very leery of that BYU will face? I've, I've said it before. The One of the harder things right now, I think, in September especially, is going down to, to Florida, Central Florida. So, honestly, that season opener against USF, Jerry Bohannon is also getting a lot of looks from the scouts and as an NFL quarterback, which may surprise some because he, you know, lost the starting job at Baylor and then transferred to USF. But this is a kid who is an upperclassman, going to be invited to all the all-star games uh, in the, the postseason here as well. So Jerry Bohannon, but to me, it's Baylor. That, that team is stacked with NFL talent, even losing as much as they did to the draft this past year. If you look at it, they got Jackson Player, the defensive tackle transfer from Tulsa to pair with Siaka Ika on the inside. And then they have Al Walcott. He's about six foot three, 220 at corner, and he moves like he's about a 5'9", 4'3", speed guy. Ooh. So to me, that defense is still incredibly talented. And then I don't need to tell anybody there, but Eric Mateos and, that, and Jeff Grimes know what they're doing on the offensive line. So that offensive line has about five NFL players at least. Yeah, Baylor is an interesting case because, as you mentioned, Cam, they lost a lot of top-tier talent. And it's always hard to assess, okay, well, how much will that impact a team, especially early the next season? But you're high on Baylor. Oregon is a team that brings back a ton of talent, but they've got a new coaching staff. They've got a transfer quarterback from Auburn and Bo Nix, and they're right there with Baylor in the national polls, just a couple of spots behind, if not one spot behind in the AP poll. Are you as high on Oregon as you are on Baylor? And if so, why or why not? In, in my offices, we call him no Knicks. So I am not very high <laughs> on Oregon at all this year. Um, I think it's actually a step down going from Anthony Brown to Bo Nix, in my opinion. I know he's got four years of SEC starting <laughs> underneath him, but at that level of play he brings is not sustainable. It's, uh, you know, his highlight real plays are when he's flushed from the pocket, running around, using that athleticism, and it's just not sustainable. So to me, Ty Thompson should be the guy going forward for them. Their offensive line is going to be good. Let's face it, Sewell is as good as anybody is at, at their position at linebacker. And so if Justin Flo plays well, there's a lot of talent there. Christian Gonzalez, the corner, though, the Colorado transfer, is a guy that I think people need to pay attention to recently getting first-round buzz. And so, yes, I'm high on their defense as a whole. I think overall, but as long as Bo Nix is quarterback, I'm not very scared of that Oregon team. BYU Notre Dame uh, speaks for itself. It'll be huge in October. But the following week, Arkansas comes to Lavelle Edwards Stadium. What about that matchup for BYU? There's a lot of talent, too, there as well. If, if Sam Pittman's done uh, one of the more miraculous jobs, I think, of turning around a program, if you consider – how what the level of play they have to play with eight nine games out of the year and how much they're competitive now where they weren't just a few years back so it's been built up from the ground from the ground up they've been doing it right on that offensive line ricky stromberg one of the best centers across the entire nation jalen catalan though another guy that if he added 20 pounds and two inches he'd be talked about in that jalen petrie derwin james-esque light so if he stays healthy They've got a lot of talent as well, but I think overall Arkansas is still about a year or two away from competing in the SEC. And then by that time uh, in, the, in the season, injuries might take hold. So I'm going to temper my expectations with Arkansas this year, um, and I'm still putting stock in that, that Baylor team as the, the more stacked team that, Bay, that BYU used to face this year. Senior Director of College Football and the NFL Draft at Pro Football Network. His name is Cam Meller. He's on BYU Sports Nation. The Cougars are eight days away from a very tricky contest, as we've discussed, against USF. Is there any other sneaky game on BYU's schedule that you see, Cam, for the Cougars? No, I think, honestly, if you, you look at it, you have to start with the top what we talked about. Notre Dame, to me, I think is where – that's probably the only game right now. Baylor and Notre Dame are the only two that I'm looking at. They shouldn't be within at least three points, four point favorites um, or favorites or at least close. I think people are going to buy a lot into Notre Dame. I think that one you put your hat in or, you know, put the pin in your cap and then just don't sleep on any of the Mountain West teams this year. I, I could pick them all out and, and decide which one I want to, and talk about quarterback play. But at this point, focus on Notre Dame, but also have uh, that peripheral vision going on all those Mountain West teams we got to play as well. We all need our peripheral vision. All right, in October, BYU is going to get their first Big 12 schedule. Who do you want to see the Cougars host in that P5 opener here? That's tough. To me, uh, I mean, if we're looking at the, the the Big 12 landscape of 2023, bring in like a UCF or a Cincinnati, and really let's let's take on those teams. Let's initiate the Big 12 play. Other than that, bring on like a Texas Tech. Um, let's see 
and how they contend with one of those teams that is a middling Big 12 team to really gauge how well they're going to fare against against those teams against the Big 12 in a, in a full Big 12 slate. Texas Texas Tech, TCU. Uh, we'll see what Iowa State does this year. They're always good, but with the, what they have to replace next year, who knows what they're going to look like next year. So to me, Texas Tech, one of those teams. Bring a Texas team. Bring a Texas team in. Not not named Baylor. I cannot wait, and I think I speak collectively for every BYU fan for what that first Big 12 schedule is going to look like. Cam, before you go, I want to go back to some personnel questions within the BYU football team uh, because, frankly, when it comes down to assessing talent in BYU, like you're kind of at the forefront. I've been at the forefront for a long time, calling your shot and being right about that shot. A guy you were very high on two years ago was Peyton Wilgar. Peyton has gone through some injuries uh, he's had kind of, it was kind of a weird year last year because he had to change what he did because of the Keenan Peely injury, and he, Peyton himself wasn't okay. Where do you stand on the stock of Peyton Wilgar as an NFL guy who you were so high on a couple of years ago? Still high on him. Um, the injury history, though, obviously, knowing what I do in every year that you look back and you say, what was maybe the ding on this player? Where was the asterisk that, they, that NFL teams I had on him? And it's injuries, typically. So unfortunately for Peyton, his NFL draft stock took a huge hit uh, when he took the hit and he was injured as well. So I'm still having him as a three down linebacker, both at the college and the NFL level. But right now I think he's that long shot to get drafted that maybe pushes it to four or five, six players that could be drafted on this team um, within the first seven rounds. But he, if, if he's not drafted, he's a guy who signs with a team immediately, if not before round seven is over um, as one of those preferred undrafted free agent guys. So uh, a full slate of 12 games act of action for him where he's playing the majority of snaps on defense, I think gets him back into that day three range because I think his coverage and his versatility to stop the run and then rush the passer is, is sort of unmatched at his level and what he does. Let's go a little deeper into your crystal ball here uh, with the news from earlier in the week that uh, Oregon has been talking to the Big Ten to see if they might be a fit here in the near future. Um, with that surfacing, what's the situation in the Pac-12? Do you see four teams still going to the Big 12 from there? Does the Pac-12 go away? And on top of all those questions, how can anyone in the Pac-12 trust Oregon if there's any truth to the notion that Oregon's talking to the Big 10? Hey, you can't really trust them, right? You can't. They're always going to look out for what they, what's best for them. And so you can't trust them at this point with, with all of reshuffling. To me, when the media rights were were established and we saw how much more money's baked into the contract for the big 10. And then there was that caveat that said, they're not done expanding. I would assume that they aggressively get as many teams as they can in a big, bigger market, or at least a marquee name. So Oregon's still a marquee name on the national landscape. I, they'd be silly not to try to bring them on um, and then get that. So to me, I don't know how much longer the PAC 12 has to uh, has on their plate coming forward if Oregon's plucked and then, you know, if they're not done in the big 10, one or two more, I, I would assume we've seen the last of a, or this will be the last competitive pac 12 season in terms of top tier play. Um, and the end probably is near if, if Oregon leaves, I think that'd be the tip of the iceberg. So many question marks for sure with conference realignment, uh, but we'll finish with this. Speaking of questions, Cam, what's the biggest question mark you have about BYU football in 2022? I think besides Tyler, Batty, I want to know who rushes the passer. I, I want to see who can get after the passer, both not not only just on the outside opposite, but also inside. Can there be enough pressure on the inside? Because the question marks also are a little bit back in the secondary. There's a few stars, but I do think that if, if pass rush and coverage, they're almost equally important. I still put the, the emphasis on coverage being more important, but pass rush is very important as well. And so need at least, at least two edge defenders and a, and a guy who can push the pocket on the inside. So I want to see who does that, who rises to the occasion this year. Cam, you are truly the insider, and uh, I just hope you find time to sleep. As a family man, no less. <laughs> you know, we're all on this boat together, wives, kids. Uh, so if you have some advice for us on how to handle it the right way, Dave and I, I'm sure, would, would take that advice happily. I'm still learning. I think every new season is an adventure. Right now, I got my three and a half year old, near, near four year old, saying, "I can't wait for football to be over already." Uh, she, <laughs> I think it's going to get me up right around those three thirty games after I've been down for about three hours on Saturdays. I think I'll probably make my way upstairs to to be around with them. So it's a balance. I think is what I've found is the best way. Outstanding, Cam. Great to talk with you. We're taking your uh, stock options to the bank, and uh, we'll discuss again soon. Enjoy the weekend of football.
The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. Sometimes the defensive coordinator, Elisa Tuyaki, gets some grief. Drop eight stinks, Cougar Board might say. Well, sometimes it's that simple, right? Second half versus Virginia, 2019 versus USC, and Utah State against young quarterbacks throwing picks. Sometimes it doesn't work as well. Drop eight, depth, MMA are all part of the discussion I had with the Cougar DC yesterday after the final scrimmage of fall camp. E. That mustache is looking super legit, dude. Uh, how would you rate your mustache compared to your cohorts on the staff? It's coming in, but I don't think I'm anything close to uh, all those other guys. They're a little bit more manly than mine. But have they competed in MMA? No, I, I can probably beat them all up. <laughs> <laughs> would be the quickest win. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, how, how's, uh, how's camp going so far? Because you guys have put a bow on technically fall camp. Um, how did you feel it went? What did you learn? I thought camp was good, you know, from the defense perspective. Um, we've got a lot of a lot of um, players that can contribute on the defensive side, which we're going to need. Um, we've got a lot of uh, experience coming back, uh, stayed healthy on the defensive side, which which was huge for us during during fall camp. But got the work that we needed, and um, we're at the point now where we're tired of beating up on each other, and we're ready to go play somebody else. What what's the greatest pro of having as much experience as you have on the defense? Because I think this might be the most experienced BYU team of all time because of COVID. You just have so many guys that you've been working with for several years. Right, right, yeah. No, I, I mean having having the experience. I mean, you know, obviously across the whole team, it's it's great to have all that uh, uh, returning power on the on the offensive side, but on defense. It gives us an opportunity to just stay deep. You know, it's uh, that's one of the things. It's just through the years. Um, starts to really get you. Last year was was an example of it. I mean, depending on the year, you hope you can stay healthy. But if you're losing anybody, um, you know things change, and your the the way that you game plan change, and the way that you want to try to stop people changes. And so, having this much much depth, having this much uh, experience, uh, for us to be able to play all the different schemes that we think we need to play to win, and not have to uh, you know not not have to uh, check certain things just because uh, we feel like it. We, we may not be able to do it. It has been great. I mean, you know, we've, we've got the depth that we feel like we need uh, right now at this point in the season, but we've also got a lot of players that have a lot of experience that have been in games, that are familiar with the system, know the language, um, and just, just giving us snaps, you know, uh, throughout the season. So I think it's, it's been, been really exciting for us to get all that. Last year was so incredible. Um, there were so many amazing wins, right? The UAB game, um, you're pretty beat up at the end there. But let's be honest, in the future, that's where you want to be ready to win a massive game, hopefully in a near six and a Big 12 championship game, right? What is it going to take to get to the point where in game 12 and 13, or I guess it might even be 13 and 14 one day, that you have the depth that you want should there be injuries because, hey, this is football. Yeah, it's, you know, that, that's a, it's a great question and, and uh, really – any team, every single team that you look at, right? It's it's all kind of relative to who you are and, and the type of players that you've got in your team. But even even when a you know when a national championship team like Georgia or Alabama, or Ohio State, and when they lose, you know, a key player on the offensive side or defensive side, it changes them a little bit, right? And so um, you know, for for us, if we can stay healthy, I mean, it just it just gives us an opportunity to compete. And like like you were saying last year, you know, three games left in the season, and we were. We're really running on fumes and just trying to figure out way to win, ways to win games. And the offense did a great job, just uh, especially in the last part of the season, just kind of carrying us and and uh, you know uh, scoring points and and uh, you know just uh, scratching and clawing our way as a team, trying to trying to find find game, uh, wins. And so um, you know, last year was was just tough. I felt like uh, going into the USC game was we were really running on fumes and and found a way to win. And the offense did a great job with that one and. And uh, UAB game was was a little bit different. I thought that there were other elements to the game uh, besides the injuries that that uh, you know we as a coaching staff, myself as a coordinator, felt like should have should have uh, done a better job at doing, um, like motivating. And I thought it was probably the biggest thing is is just motivating them to you know you're almost set up all year to play in a pretty pretty cool bowl, and then you go to one that uh, you know maybe you feel like you deserved a better one. And I felt like 
uh, that entitlement, you know, probably trickled from the top down for myself to the players and so so. You know, getting the players in a better mindset is, is where I really felt like I failed as a coordinator, felt like uh, didn't do a good enough job uh, inspiring them to play ball when we needed to play. And, you know, t- take that one on me and feel like we'll come back this next year and be ready to be ready to give it another go. And I don't want to linger on the UAB game because there were six power five wins there. You know what I mean? But it, it is interesting because the goals of this program starting next year are to win a Big 12 title. And in game 13, you've got to be your best, which is tough given, uh, you know, how deep you can be. Because with the transfer portal, E, it's tough because you can't have like a legit three sitting there that isn't anxious to play. You know what I mean? If they're not in the top two, they may bounce. So it's hard to really get that depth because yeah. people want to play. So um, in terms of what, what you have this year, obviously you have a ton of experience. Does that change the way you call plays in game and or prepare knowing, okay, we have people who have been there who know the calls, as you mentioned, who have been in the fights how does that change anything for you compared to where maybe some of your backups would be RMs you have to throw in the mix, which is not the case this year? Yeah, it, it does. It changed. It does change the way that you call it. And this fall camp, uh, you know, has been really good for us as a defense to really, um, you know, figure out who we are and where we're at. And, uh, you know, the, the biggest thing with defenses is um, can you play man? Can you play man coverage? Um, can you play quarters coverage, which is really a lot more aggressive than man coverage? Um, and can you do can you do it consistently? Do you have to you know how many change ups do you need in it? So like the Virginia game, for instance, right? We went in mm-hmm. with a game plan to go a lot of man coverage and just had a couple change ups. Well, uh, that was that was a weird game because uh, we were up twenty one nothing in the first quarter, but but the TV the, the ESPN people hadn't flipped over, and so we were we were still not <laughs> a televised game. And so the refs were tra- were at the you know they were trying to just hurry the game up, and we were going fast and. Felt like we got to the point where we were we were still uh, schematically playing a lot of the same coverages. We were playing a lot of man, but uh, physically and with our depth, we just weren't we weren't there yet. We weren't we weren't at the the point where we can continue to play man. We, uh, me as a coordinator, should have saw that and said, you know what, let's throw more changeups in it now because we're going fast. There's no timeouts. There's no TV timeouts. The offense is scoring in one or two plays. We're back out on the field, um, and we start to see that in the second quarter where we're playing with a lot of bad. Um, technique because of fatigue and playing with a lot of bad, really just calls by my, my, my part, there's a lot, lot, lot more aggression uh, in situations where we probably just should have said, Hey, let's, let's back it up a little bit, make them earn it. Let's get ourselves back in zones, give you time to, uh, uh, you know, to catch up. Uh, but uh, it wasn't until halftime when we came back and made that adjustment and played a little bit better in the second half. But that second quarter was, uh, that was the wild, wild West, man. That was, that was crazy. <laughs> that was a five Coke night for me. <laughs> I, I, had that, I had that many in the press box. <laughs> okay, for all you drop eight haters, that wins the Virginia game, as we've talked about. Um, but I'm a drop eight uh, proponent, especially given the way the secondary is played, which brings me to this. Caleb Hayes uh, had an incredible interview with Spencer on Saturday. It was great. He addressed being black and not a member of the church at BYU and how great this place is, the secondary, his personal goals. He feels like this secondary could be one of the best in BYU history. Now, obviously, he said, hey, we got to go out and prove it. Yeah, But how confident are you in their abilities, Caleb Hayes and D'Angelo Mandel and Jacob Robinson now at corner and uh, Gabe Judy Lally? It feels like that's a, a pretty talented group right now. Yeah, and that's that's uh, that's one of the things that's changed for us this fall camp where um, really never felt uh, never, never felt like we were at a point where we needed to to have a change up. You know, it was like, OK, we're really uh, playing uh, pedal to the metal full throttle right now. And it's because. Uh, coach coach Guilford switching out the corners and we're still you know and that's and that's one thing that I always check right like uh hey gee just let me know let me know if we need to change up let me know if your guys are tired it's uh can you play cover zero can you play man coverage can you keep the pedal to the metal when do you need change ups and there's always uh schematical things I mean you don't nobody ever goes out there and keeps the pedal to the metal for the full 60 minutes I mean it's just that you don't play football like that or 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 else you're going to end up getting a couple of interceptions, a couple of sacks, and you're going to give up 60. You know what I mean? It's just, there's, there's a, there's a, uh, you know, there's just schemes to the way that you do things and there's, there's tactics to it too. But, um, you know, the never felt as we were, as we were in this fall camp that uh, coach Guilford ever gave me the, Hey, you know, we're going to need a couple of snaps here. It was just one guy after another and just switch them in. And we've got freshmen in there that are getting, getting reps. And, you know, they, they may be running the wrong coverage, but they're like, stride for stride running with really good receivers. And so 
feel like we've got the athleticism right now. Just uh, we got to get the couple of the young guys to give us some snaps. If we can get, you know, one or two or three of those those freshman corners that can really give us snaps sometime during this year, maybe the last half of the year, uh, with catching up and understanding college ball and, and schemes, that'll that'll prepare us for a really good future for the secondary uh, next year and the following year and the year after that. The best of BYU Sports Nation. We'll be right back. Rise and shout for the trending topics of the week here on the best of BYU Sports Nation. You're talking about it, and so are we. It's what's trending on BYU Sports Nation. Dave, we just talked about Jaron Hall and the most recent preseason nod with these preseason honors and accolades coming in. And the list is getting long, okay? Uh, you jokingly this morning called it the Magnificent Seven. That's so a big let, list. let's lay out the Magnificent <laughs> Seven. He is on the preseason award watch list for the Maxwell Award, okay. the Manning Award, the College Football Players Association National Performer of the Year Award, the Davey O'Brien Award, Walter Camp Player of the Year Award, the Johnny Unitas Golden Arm Award, which we just mentioned, and he's uh, on the Reese's Senior Bowl Award watch list. That's Dave, a lot of watching. Uh, seriously, a lot of eyes on Jaron Hall. How much pressure is on Jaron Hall and his shoulders now going into this season with all of these preseason nods? Because this is different than what we saw with Zach Wilson a couple of years ago. You know, BYU put out a tweet yesterday of uh, Hall mic'd up during the scrimmage so you could kind of climb into his head as he leads the team around the field. And I watched that a couple of times. I'm like, I don't know if there's any pressure on him he feels like he is right in his element, living the dream, yeah. and with, with full command as the leader on the field. Now around it, as, as you read those lists and as fans talk, and, and, and then we create this, well, there has to be all this pressure because of all this stuff. But it, he appears to be in a really good place where it's like, here's the thing, I want, I want all of that because I really want to be on one big list, which is the scout list coming up for the NFL draft. <laughs> oh, so he's, these, he's on it. If these watch lists keep everybody watching, the real list he wants, the watch list he wants is the draft list. And um, I think you, Zach, was, Zach had, no, he had no accolades coming in. Didn't even know he was going to be the starting quarterback uh, coming in. Yeah, how about that? He yeah. was battling with the likes of Jaron Hall and Baylor Romney and yeah. others for that starting position. COVID helped him a little bit because it, it took a lot of quarterbacks and sat him out. As BYU kept playing, other schools didn't. And so he's on TV every week. And Magnified he was, he was great. lens. And, uh, and didn't play any P5s. Um, but he played great. And, you know, $35 million later, it was like, that's a great, that was a great season for him. But he didn't have near the hype that all the greats at BYU had to deal with. You know, but for Bosco, he wins the national championship. He still had a senior season. Talk about hype. Mm. You won the national title, and now you're coming in. Detmer wins the Heisman. Then he plays his senior season. Talk about hype and ex expectation. McMahon goes 12-1 and one as a junior. Then he's got his next season. Steve Young, the same thing. And, and they all answered the bell. You can throw in Sarkeesian and John Beck. And then when it came to time to get a job, everyone knew who they were. Yeah, we, we've seen both sides of this. Uh, and you talk about John Beck and Steve Sarkeesian. Sarkeesian went 7-4 and four in 1995, uh, but they felt like they were on the cusp of something special. He finished really strong yes. against Fresno State, yes. and also it was like, whoa. So th that one game kind of gave us a taste. We are like, okay, all right. Um, but Sark didn't have this type of preseason, these type of preseason accolades coming in. John Beck was kind of in a similar situation. Played well at times in 2005, but then 2006 kind of took that step forward. Yeah. But Jaron is like, to your point, Jaron is, is of the mentality that I don't feel like this type of stuff bothers him. I don't, I don't think he reads into it. I watched the same clip that you did yesterday a couple of times. He feels like he's in complete command. His team listens to him. They trust him. They respect him. They believe in him. He's just a different type of leader, uh, and he's a different type of player than Zach Wilson. So I kind of feel like we're comparing apples and oranges, but also for Jaron's benefit, he has a ton of talent returning around him, specifically yeah. on the offensive line. And so while, yes, there is pressure to perform as the quarterback, it's the quarterback position. By nature, it carries pressure but he's got so much talent around him, I think that they can help alleviate that and they can carry some of that on their shoulders too. You want all that for the BYU quarterback, for the 10 quarterbacks that are going to follow him, 
they want this kind of spotlight. That's why they, that's why they come. That's why the others came. And I'm reminded of a great scene from Pirates of the Caribbean as we were talking this morning in our morning meeting. And you got Norrington dressing down Captain Sparrow as, <laughs> as what he says, you're probably the worst pirate I have ever heard of. And Jack Sparrow looks at him and says, but you have heard of me. <laughs> it is important to be heard, to be noticed in this game where you want something bigger down the road. And, and I, I, I think Hall would, would look in the mirror and go, man, that is a little bit of expectation but I wouldn't want it any other way for a guy who wants to play in the NFL. He's putting himself in a great position to transition to that next level. Now he has to go do it. Now he's got to go perform. He's got to take care of business. But to his credit, I mean, 20 touchdown passes, five interceptions, a four to one touchdown to interception ratio. BYU wins 10 games. They go six and one against seven power fives. Yeah, Jaron Hall's noticed. And he's going to continue to be noticed. I feel like if he has a great season, Dave, right now he's probably projected late second round, early third round pick. If he's got a, he has a great season, and you can define great how you want to. But if he, even if he puts up similar numbers to last year, if he's got 20 touchdown passes and five interceptions again against a tough schedule, his stock will rise. Yeah. He'll, be a, he'll be a second round pick. Like if he has like gaudy numbers and they're just off the charts good, then that's how he sneaks into the first round. But, I mean, if he just kind of maintains this year against that schedule with all his talent around him, He's going to be a second-round pick. That's why there is so much pressure on this team to go to Tampa and win that first game. Because Baylor's 10th in the country. That, that's a signature moment. But you got to, you got to, you know, to have a signature moment, you got to be, be on the paper. You've got you to get through South Florida. And we all expect that they will. But that's going to be a tough game. And, uh, you know, all of the summer is like when you look at, oh, he's got Notre Dame. If he looks good into Notre Dame, he could get an NFL job. Well, Arkansas after that, that's pretty good. Oregon on the road, okay, all right. And then, of course, Baylor, and even Stanford on Thanksgiving whenever, weekend when everyone's watching football. But it starts with South Florida. Yes. And, and that, that's kind of where when you start thinking about, what's the biggest game of the season? Well, let's go with Coach Talk, the next game of the season. It, re it where, really Which is. is the first game of the season. So many reasons this game looms large in South Florida in Tampa for a guy like Jaron Hall, and we've chronicled all of them. That's why we have a two-hour pregame show. <laughs> we need all of it. Just to build the We need the, every second moment. of that, for, <laughs> for sure. I'm, I'm always intrigued by uh, the conversation of pressure. Like, how, how do you quantify the units of pressure? We don't know. Like, we don't know how much pressure these guys are feeling, but we can say in confidence, and you and I agree on this, that Jaron's not feeling all of the pressure solely on him. Like, he, he knows what he has around him, and that's huge. And the weird thing about pressure is it's relative. Um, you know how to do this show. But if we grab someone off the street and sit them down and turn the camera on, they're under immense pressure, and they feel it because they have no idea what they're doing. I got called up on stage to sing with Marie Osmond at a show the other night. That was immense pressure. That's pressure. That is out of my wheelhouse. Calling a football game? Well, hey, we've done that a million years. Yeah. We've done it. And, and we know how to prepare for it. So that's why I wonder if, is, is he really feeling pressure? Or is he going, sweet, playing the game I love. Everyone knows I'm playing, and I got a really good team. As opposed to you or me playing quarterback at South Florida going, <laughs> I don't even know what to do with the football. Um, Tell me which shoulder to turn over and how to hand it off to Chris Brooks. That's where we'd be. Rock stars playing in front of a stadium. Is there pressure on them or are they in their wheelhouse? It, it feels like they're in their wheelhouse. Take a rock star and put them in an interview. I interviewed Barry Manilow one time. A little different. It was totally different. He was fidgety and nervous and couldn't control that moment. But on the stage, he knew what note was coming and what song was coming, and he was a, and he was a superstar. And I'm thinking, maybe pressure's relative to, sure. are you even prepared to do it? Yeah. And if you are, maybe it's not pressure. Maybe it's opportunity and fun. Yeah. They're, to your point, BYU football, with all the experience they have, they feel like they're collectively in their element. Jaron feels like he's in his element. There are always butterflies maybe those oh, yeah. first few you gotta have those. plays. Like, that's natural, but then when you get into your element and you've got that experience, that's when you start to see special things happen. You're talking about it, and so are we. It's What's Trending on BYU Sports Nation. Yesterday, we aired an interview with Spencer Linton where he talked to Caleb Hayes Saturday after a scrimmage at Lavelle Edwards Stadium. Uh, if you missed it, check it out on YouTube. Fantastic conversation, 18 minutes worth. It was great. Hayes said this could be the best BYU defensive back group ever. Here's what he said. 
this DB group, I feel like it's going to, it's also, I feel like it's at least, at least top three, top two, honestly, <laughs> top one DB groups at BYU. Like I said, we haven't proved anything. You know, I can, I can, I can go off and on and on how much we, we're, we're going to be great and all that, but like, you know, it hasn't, we haven't hit like, you know, uh, the field yet you know we're not at usf right now to really showcase that but all you can say you know just trust in the process yeah you get yeah, apparently it's the philadelphia 76ers uh from a couple of years ago uh but without ben simmons which is great okay spencer if the BYU defensive backs end up like caleb hayes is saying top three maybe top one what would that look like well, I think first and foremost, Sharon, when you look back at the great defensive back groups that BYU has had in history, and I mean, a few immediately popped to mind, like early 90s with obviously Derwin Gray and Irvin Lee and Tony Crutchfield, those guys. Then you go to 96 with Omar Morgan and Tim McTire. And then back into 2012 and 13, like BYU had a really nice group of defensive backs and a really nice defense overall. I think you got to look at the talent that has gone to the next level. That's the first indicator. So, I mean, we, we might not know if they're the best group ever until we see them perform on the field well at BYU. But then if those guys can make the leap to the NFL as well, like their predecessors in the groups I mentioned earlier, because look, BYU like, historically just does not put a ton of defensive backs and secondary guys into the league. We made a huge deal about Chris Wilcox being the first draft pick as a defensive back in uh, 2021 uh, since Derwin Gray was drafted in the early 90s. I mean, it just it does not happen often. And so if we want to see BYU take that next step, I think you got to look at, at their ability to get guys to the next level. We've seen some free agents. Michael Davis was talked about yesterday. But that's kind of the first indicator to me is like, OK, yes, that's a sign of an elite defensive back group is that they can make that leap from BYU and playing well BYU into the league. And then, of course, the results on the field. BYU, historically, when they went through all those whack years, I mean, they'd get into these just massive shootouts and, like, these high-scoring games, 58, 56, and 45, 41. Like, that was very, very typical. If we can see those numbers of BYU's opponents stay under the 24-point mark, the off-mentioned Bronco Mendenhall defensive mark, then that's a, that's a sign of a great defense, and I think specifically a great secondary because with the pass-happy options that BYU is going to see this year in the offenses they face, the ball's coming out quickly, they keep everything in front and keep opponents to 24 points or fewer, like that's another great indicator. I mean, we can look at interceptions and like big plays given up. You know, BYU hasn't given up a ton of big plays. Uh, the metrics that we see from Pro Football Focus would indicate that BYU has been really, really good over the past few years of not giving up like these huge game-breaking plays. Like that, that, that is another indicator. I would like to see a few more interceptions. Caleb Hayes said, I want to pick six. Pick sixes don't happen often at BYU. Now, if, if we could reverse the, the big plays that offense has put together and see BYU make some game-breaking defensive plays, some defensive touchdowns specifically from the secondary, that too is an obvious indicator of guys being able to break on a ball, make a play, and give BYU some immediate points. And so those are my initial thoughts. I mean, I know you've you spent a lot of time obviously looking at the stats, but I mean, does it come down to very, very specific analytics for you? Or are you seeing it kind of more big picture like I am with those guys taking the next leap to the NFL? There's so few dudes that make it to the next level that I almost think it's unfair to try and assess BYU football in that way because then no one really qualifies or there's only been like a handful ever, maybe, right? This isn't, D this isn't DBU, right? This, isn't, this is QBU, this is tight end U. So I think we almost have to assess a little differently this position, but I agree with you that the best secondaries that come to mind when we compare this group, should they be that good, is exactly what you said. It's 1990. Uh, it's 2001, it's 1996, it's 2012. I love that one. Think about 2012, Jordan Johnson and Preston Hadley at the corners. Neither of the, those guys had a cup of coffee or a post them in the NFL, but they were great collegiate cornerbacks. Like, if you want to talk about one of the best cornerbacks in Bureau history, it's Tom Homo. Tom Homo had, like, a bunch of pick sixes, including in the 81 Holiday Bowl against Washington State, including against Georgia and that Herschel Walker offense in 82, where BYU almost won NFL in guy. the hedges. Yes, NFL guy, Super Bowl champ, one time as a player, three times as a coach for Tom, right? So, yeah, Derwin Gray played in the NFL for several years. It's not necessarily the NFL for me, per se. I, I think with this group, and think about this group, there's not a lot of BYU football teams who will have played a schedule like this in history, that 91 group, certainly, several independent groups. 
But to me, yeah, I look at interceptions. The secondary itself had 10 last year. That's a decent number. If they can get a few more, that's great. PBUs, 36 is a pretty good number. 12 from Caleb Hayes by himself, by the way. How about that? Yeah. Pass yeah. efficiency, um, it's not a secondary number only. It's the whole defense, but BYU was 54th. They can do better there. Yards per attempt allowed, 60th in the country. Again, that's the whole defense. But Cougar Stats has a good uh, metric that I like here. BYU opponents had 121 passes which weren't completed, so incompletions or interceptions last year. Of those, 52 were defended, batted down, intercepted, right? 43%, that rate, highest in the country. I wonder if this group's mm. better than we think. Obviously, the Caleb Hayes stat sticks out as well. We'll repeat it because it's so good, courtesy of Pro Football Focus. 18 times opposing quarterbacks threw 20-plus yards down the field at Caleb. Only one was caught. Third in FBS at 5.6%. So we like D'Angelo Mandel and Caleb Hayes and Gabe Judy Lally. At safety, Malik Moore is a baller. Ammon Hanneman steps in probably at that strong safety spot. And then you got to uh, consider Hayle, uh, Hayden Livingston. Micah Harper has moved uh, back to safety. Jacob Robinson, of course, moving up to corner, kind of that nickel guy. Talon Offrey is a guy who tours Achilles. He's going to be in the two deep. This is, this is a good group. Bill Shefflin, by the way, uh, two-time first-team yeah, all-whack, yeah. got hurt his rookie year in the NFL. He might be the greatest uh, you know, secondary player in BYU history. Like, Bill Shefflin obviously blocks the punt in the Miracle Bowl, which he's known for, but he was incredible. So there have been some really good secondaries. I really like the talent that BYU has now uh, uh, in the group. I'm, I'm very confident in, in four to five guys. When Michael Harper gets healthy, he adds to that group. I'm stoked. And when BYU has a good secondary and you're not giving up big plays, guess what? You're going to be in the biggest games like Notre Dame, like at Oregon, like Baylor and Arkansas. Yeah, we should note that BYU's athletic director, Tom Homo, just gave Bill Shefflin a shout out for sure. That was a very talented secondary in the early 80s for the Cougars. Like, I know Jimmy Mack gets a lot of the credit. That was a really, really good defense. So you got to appreciate Tom Homo looking out for his guy, Bill Shefflin. Jerem, I love the guys that you bring up on this current roster. The defensive back group, I feel like it's, we just kind of go round and round with this record. Like, I'm sorry if you're tired of hearing about it, but we think that this, we kind of tend to agree with Caleb Hayes. We think this could be like a top three group all time because, and you talked about the difficult schedule that they're going to face this year. I feel like BYU and this group are ready to face the schedule this year because of what they faced last year and what they accomplished against yes. last year's schedule. Albeit against a down Pac-12, but still, like seven power Bump fives, them. Jerem. Six and one against seven power fives. And they put up some pretty good numbers. So I, I, I'm not, I don't feel like it's too difficult for this group to handle. They've, they've played and accomplished a lot of meaningful things in meaningful games with big time snaps. I trust Caleb. I mean, he said, look, we're not scared. We're not scared of anybody. We have seen basically everything. We have seen some elite receivers. And going back a few years before, BYU taking on the likes of USC and Tennessee with Juwan Jennings and all of these dudes that are in the NFL now. Like, they have seen so much over the last few years. They've built to this, this wealth of experience. It's time for it to pay off, and I think it will. And we're not saying, you know, there are three first-round picks in this. Like, maybe there are some NFL no, draft picks no. here, and that's exciting. But this, against BYU historically, this group stacks up, which is very exciting. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. Hear what the coaches, athletes, and experts have to say. Here's another great interview from the week on the best of BYU Sports Nation. Now, I do want to rewind uh, to something that happened last Saturday when, you know, the goat of mascots just added to his legacy. Cosmo skydives into Lavelle Edwards Stadium, but in collaboration with Built Bar. Yes. Okay? So this is happening. It's super cool. The landing is just, oh, well, well done, Cosmo, right? <laughs> Okay. If you would have heard the music, though, right there, it was like almost like he couldn't have timed it any better. Yeah. And the music just goes boom. There's a song from uh, Into the Spider-Verse yes, playing, yes, right? Yes, it was so good. Oh, it's it so, so, good. so great. Okay, was there ever, I mean, any inclination in your mind that maybe I should skydive with Cosmo, too? Did you ever consider that? 100,000%. Does that, does that prove it? Because I say 100,000%. <laughs> I, want, I wanted to, and we were planning on it, and then they figured out since it's in the stadium, and we're going in the stadium, I couldn't. Really? I, have, I think 50 or 100 jumps. What? In order to do it into the stadium itself. 
You okay? To myself. So okay. Because so, of liability. Have you sky? You skydived never, before then? Never, You've never skydived. Never, but I was ready. <laughs> Stupid and ready for sure. <laughs> we didn't want to see a slam into the press box or no. that, or get no, caught but you in the lights. It, it was good to see Cosmo become become the spotlight of that. It was awesome. Yeah, made for great video, and and this whole thing is made for for some great moments for for you and and for Bill. Let's go back to last year. Um, you make headlines everywhere, Sports Center, and you name it because somebody decided that they were going to do somebody, something for walk-ons. Mm. So when did that idea hatch that it's like, I want to do something, let me go to the folks who are totally off the radar and help them, and that puts you completely on the radar. No, absolutely no credit here. I mean, really, credit goes to Kalani. His love for those boys, his love for the team, his love for the underdog, mm. and when he's like, what can we do to help them out, immediately it was obvious, okay, this is what we got to do. It actually started with just six. And then we thought, well, let's do 10. And then we realized, well. Because, you know, it's an expensive Yeah, yeah it kind of adds here. up a little yeah. bit. I don't know if you knew that. I learned <laughs> it in math class one time. But, uh, and then we realized, no, we got to do all of them. We got to do all of them. And, but it definitely wasn't intended, all right, let's do all of them and, like, make, you know, national headlines. Right. It just happened naturally. Did you envision it getting the type of national no. attention that it did? No, not at all. It was wild. It was cool. It was crazy. But listen, that's like 15 minutes of fame or whatever you want to call it. We got work to do now, and the team's got work to do. And that's what excites us is like, how can we help, you know, build a stronger team? And But yet, at the same time, highlight these boys, these young men who give everything they got yeah. to make those scholarship players even that much better. Tell us uh, an experience with, say, your favorite experience with one of these guys uh, who, who's had their life altered because of your participation with with BYU football, what, what have you heard? What? You know, I, I haven't said this much, but there was an experience when I first started my business, a, a business 20 years ago, and there was an individual, two individuals who gave me my first loan at the bank, and it was the Gunthers, and it was Talmadge dad and his uncle. No way. And so when they called up Talmadge uh, on that second guy, when, uh, you know, coach calls him up and he says, you know, it's Talmadge. I thought, you gotta be kidding me. Fellow Lone Peaker, this is so good. I love this kid, and it gave me goosebumps. And I thought, okay, this is being led. This is being guided. That's pretty cool. His family gave you your first loan. The, yeah, the Gunther family and Bank of American Fork at the time, to, to be able to launch a company of mine, and, and gave you, me trust and in then me. You gave Gunther a boost. Yeah, it was a little bit smaller of a boost, you know, that they gave me. So he didn't have I, to pay I owe, back. I owe more. He doesn't I, have to pay true. back. No interest. No <laughs> yeah, that's interest. right. No interest. <laughs> well, that was really cool to watch because he was super emotional. Yeah. I mean, like watching all these guys come up, and it's hard not. Like first time I saw the video, it was hard for me not to get emotional oh. for them because I know, to a degree, what they go through. And Kalani talks about and tries to document like what their life is really like as a walk-on player. And I mean, just to be clear, like. There was a stipend given to every player on the BYU team, but it right. was specifically focused on getting those walk-on players, essentially, scholarships. So now that it's, you know, a year has passed, um, wh what are you trying to do this time around? Because you're back again. Yeah. Like, like why, why come back again? Are you, what are you trying to do differently? What, how have things progressed in that regard? Yeah, no, great question. I mean, really, this is just the start of what we want to do with student athletes in general. Uh, we want to go do something across the nation in general. It's not just BYU themselves, but of course, we're a little biased towards BYU. Love these guys. Love those players right there. They're so good. They're so good. We see them out on the field as fans, and we revere them. But you know what? These guys are real. They're legit, and they love each other. And that's what's so cool to see that, that interaction in the locker room. And if we can build off of that to go do something bigger, and bolder than just like, okay, just sports itself, that's when it gets pretty fun and cool. And it's not about just giving out free money. These guys are asked to do things in return. What kind of things through NIL are these players asked to do, uh, no matter who the uh, contributor is? Yeah. You know, right now, I mean, one of the things we ask, of course, talking about our Cougar Tail, which is a little epic. We kind of like it. It's one of my favorites, if not my favorite now. But most importantly, what we're trying to do is we want to go feed and fuel kids. And um, we want these, these players, these athletes, um, these student athletes to go out there and say, all right, you know what? We're going to rally in our communities and we're going to help feed and fuel these kids mm -hmm. and actually give back to our local communities in different ways. And how can we build men out of boys? That's what we would like to do. So, yeah, so there's a, there's a hey, we, we expect you to take this. We expect you to do this. Yeah. And, uh, and that's good because then it gives some responsibility. We always like money to fall out of the sky. <laughs> but like Cosmo, when right? it's handed to us, and oh, by the way, here's the plan for you to make a difference. Yeah. Then all of a sudden you've got, you've got somebody engaged. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the initiative involved specifically with the Cougar Tail 
built puff yeah. bar is is really cool. And I mean, I know you've you've touched on that, but uh, I I do need to ask. I'd be remiss if I didn't. How does it taste? Is it do, do you like it? You, you know what? Maybe, maybe after after the show, you have to taste it. Um, you tell me what you experience. Okay. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. And guess what? You don't feel guilty <laughs> after it, which I love. Yeah, it's pretty good. Can we try it's pretty good. But uh, that, that's just me. That's just me. What do you see and envision for your company and their involvement with BYU, not just a football team, but athletics overall? Yeah, I mean, right now in fueling stations, we are fueling athletes. We love that. We want to do it more. Um, our company is a company in innovation. We are innovating a ton of a ton of new products, specifically with bars and different types of bars. This is just like we're scratching the scratch of the scratch on the surface, which is fun and exciting. But we want to build off this, and, and player development is is really key for us and important for us. Most of these kids, they're not going to go and play professionally. We know that. We love them while they're here, but how can we help build something special on this foundation? Because they're going to be leaders when they go back out. When they, yeah. when they leave here, they're going to be leaders in their community. That's what's pretty cool. There are a lot of folks who... Um who haven't spent a lot of time studying what NIL is and what it does. They just see in the headlines, uh, this kid's getting a million dollars for here or $9 million for this. And they think, wait a sec, all this money coming in to pay the players is yeah. the notion is going to ruin the game. Um, as an NIL person, how do you respond to that? And, and, and obviously we've heard some of that is we're, we're improving lives. They just happen to be playing the game. Yeah. But there is a little bit of a stigma because there aren't any rules. Right. And there are places that take advantage of no rules. Right. BYU is not yeah. one of them. But yeah. what do you say to that? Yeah, you know, I wish it was called N W L. I mean, I know it sounds a bit weird, but I truly, I wish it was more about we and the team yeah. and how we can build off the team. That's what we're trying to do. Our dialogue, um, our narrative behind this is is really it's a, it's about the team. It, Coach, you remember this as a little kid. Coach always said, "There's no I in team." Right. But what are we teaching right now? There's I in team right now. And that's what NIL is creating, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and so can we create a different narrative, a different dialogue, and talk more about the we and the team and building upon that team? Yeah, it's going to be hard. Sure. Because it's going towards that I, and it is that I and those eight, $9 million deals. Mm -hmm. But is it really doing anything? You ask the players. In fact, ask them, do you move the needle for these companies and do you feel like you're doing much, most of these players? And they're going to say, I kind of feel empty. Yeah. I don't feel like it's like. But what they do feel fulfillment is when they're working together as a team. Yeah. That's when they get excited. The NWL initiative is a worthwhile venture. I, I like that. Nick it seems Greer, like we could get that change. Yeah. Should Nick we go, Greer, should we go CEO buy that of, domain? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you buy that domain. That'd be good. CEO of Built Bar, Nick Greer, is with us on BYU Sports Nation. Uh, you're obviously a fan and have experienced some great things working closely with these specific athletes. But what was the moment your BYU fandom went next level when you were little? Like, when, when did this really begin for you? Yeah. Washington, BYU game. Um, I was a kid, elementary school. We flew into Washington. We went golfing. And uh, um, Chambers Bay, I remember this. That wasn't Chambers Bay. We did Chambers Bay a little bit later. But there was a, it was the Redwood. I remember big Redwoods. And we went to that game, and we got smoked. Um, and it was tough, and it was embarrassing. Like I remember 55 to 7. Exactly. Right. And I remember being in the car in traffic, and we had our BYU gear on. And people were just yelling at us, screaming at us. And I remember the guy we were with my, with my dad, and he said, roll up the window. And I'm like, I'm not rolling down, the, uh, rolling up the window. I'm keeping it down. I'm showing I'm a Cougar fan. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll never forget that moment going through, the, through traffic. And that was a moment that I'm like, you know what? I believe. Wow. So that, 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 okay, so you're, you, you doubled down on your fandom after a, an embarrassing blowout yeah. loss. <laughs> That's a refiner's fire. Right <laughs> that, that is real commitment for sure. Okay, um, you've been at practice. You've been watching the team. Yeah. Um, and, and you've been in close conversations with, with Kalani. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to break down like film or, or, or plays and, and reveal secrets, but I'm going to ask you about the feeling and the emotion that you get from this team and why you feel like they are capable of something special this season, because I know you feel that way. Yeah, solid. Absolutely solid. But you know what I love what Coach is doing? He's focusing on those small details, and he's like he's not complacent. And I love that. It's like complacency will kill. Mm -hmm. And what he's doing is like, we're not complacent. we got to get better in these details. And you know what? It's, uh, it's things that are going to be taught greatly to these boys for the rest of their life, these principles, and that's what excites me. But there's something a little different. There's a swagger. There's this confidence, a great confidence that you see, and you're like, I love it. I love it. And Jaron Hall, I mean, talk about a freaking rock star. <laughs> I love that guy. I lo he's a superstar, but he's good in here inside his heart, yeah. which makes him great. It makes him very 
beloved for BYU yeah. fans for sure. Beloved right up until. <laughs> you know, let's, We're brutal, if right? It stays, if, it's, <laughs> if he does well in South Florida, he stays beloved. He's, you're fighting for being beloved. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's not yeah, easy. That's tough. Not easy. Nick, thank you. Nick, it's great to have you on oh, BYU thank Sports you so Nation. Much, you we appreciate everything you're doing appreciate for BYU you. Athletics, and uh, we look forward to you know, more of the collaboration and what it's going to do to change lives. Let's do it. We'll be right back with more of the best of BYU Sports Nation. The best of BYU Sports Nation collects our favorite conversations and brings them to you every Saturday. Cougar Whip Round presented by Marisk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. For the first time since 1997, BYU begins the fall season with three teams nationally ranked, soccer, women's volleyball, and football. How many sports will finish the season ranked? Whew, if we're just talking just fall sports, man, and these the, we're referencing the big three of soccer, volleyball, and football. But let's throw in cross country men's and women's too, Dave. Like, I believe that all three of these teams, plus cross country men's and women's, will finish the fall sports season ranked. So I'm gonna say five, five. BYU teams will finish the fall sports calendar ranked in their respective top 25 polls. For the second straight season, yes. right? Yeah, I think it's it, pretty good. Give me a reason why I should doubt that any of these teams would do so. I know women's soccer is number nine, women's volleyball is number nine, and football is number 25, but I mean, again, give me, give me, a, give me a reason. Who's like, got the most? Who's got the most to replace from last year? Soccer. Probably women's soccer. So that that that'll be a challenge because they've got a challenging schedule, but they're still good. But they're high enough that even if they lose a few matches and then get going as teams do in the latter part of the season. They're going to be right there and, and probably compete for another West Coast Conference Championship. All three of those, plus cross-country men's and women's, are going to finish right. Bring on the Big 12. This group's ready. All right, BYU football went on the annual Provo River raft trip yesterday. Dave, if you were to join them, and this is, get think carefully, which position group would you join in a raft? <laughs> Look, that water's freezing cold. I've been down that <laughs> thing on a tube. And he got everyone saying, I'm the captain now. I don't know who the captain is of this thing, but what I'm not doing is getting in a raft with that awesome offensive line. Because I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if you can keep the water out. Okay. What about you? For whatever reason, I feel like the special teams guys, because they're so unique and crafty, they would like have their way with the paddles. Like <laughs> they, they understand like angles and are meticulous in their preparation because they have to be in the limited action they see on the field. So I, I kind of felt like I'd probably go with the kickers and the special teams guys. And Ryan Rico's a beast too. He can be the anchor in the back of the ref. You know, right? and those are those He's are great athlete. guys. They're like, hey, let's avoid that rock. Let's let's do that. <laughs> it's all about field position for them. Where do I want to be? Where's the best chance for success? Get me in the middle of the field. Yeah. And let me kick it down. Now, the if you want the craziest group, I think in terms of just like super brash and confident. Then you go with the defensive backs, I think. Like, they're <laughs> oh, like, yeah. oh, that's the biggest rock. Let's go there. Let's, go. I think we can Let's take attack the biggest rock. You know, one thing people don't realize is that water comes out of the bottom of Deer Creek. It is as cold so as cold. cold is. It is so cold. And uh, when you're in the raft, the last thing you want to do is be in the water. <laughs> it looked like they had a great time. Great way to wrap up camp. And now they can get focused. Turn their attention to USF. But you know what it won't be in, um, in South Florida? It won't be nice and dry and all that stuff. And it won't be that cold, you know, once you're in the water, but it will be hot, humid, and muggy, and the opposite of what we got going on here. All right. All right, here's a big one. I hate that you're going to ask this. At 48 years old, Terrell Owens ran a 4.3840. 43840. He's 48 years old. Here he goes, right here. In the dash of the Titans. And watching this made us wonder, uh, how old would T.O. have to be for you, Spencer, to beat him in the fourth? Because <laughs> we've also got exclusive footage of that boy. He gets ripped. Now, here's the, here's the other side of the coin. I'm wearing maroon shorts. Yes, of my high school shorts. Go. But what? First Big baggy shorts. 20, 30, 40. He's in. Yeah. The. Uh... What people don't see is he went right over to urgent care. <laughs> After, after this. So uh, how old does T.O. got to be for you to take him? Well, listen, I, I, I'm guessing I'd probably run somewhere around like a 5'3 right now. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, how old does it have to be to run a 5'3? I'm going to give T.O. another decade, okay? Like, 
probably 60 years old and then we could have a, have a race. But I would need to be my same age. That's the problem, Dave. Like I'm getting older just like he is. Yeah, that's true. He's getting older differently. So I would need to stay the same age and he would need to like crawl up to 60 and that's how I would maybe, maybe compete with him. Here's the thing with T.O. He's probably thinking, looking at his time going, I think there's a team that would probably, <laughs> would probably get me back in the league. I gotta do that again. But I gotta do it with like professional training and like the right clothing. And, and not running on a field that had just been aerated. <laughs> the, the, the first bad choice you made was the maroon shorts, and then it just went from there. Join the conversation 24-7 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook using the hashtag BYUSN. The best of BYU Sports Nation rolls on after this. Get caught up in the week in Cougar Sports. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. You're talking about it, and so are we. It's What's Trending on BYU Sports Nation. What's Trending presented by Tim Daly Ford, part of the Tim Daly Auto Group serving Utah since 1968. Dave, it's a fun Friday. It's football eve of sorts on the college front, and we're going to play a little game. We're going to have some fun with our friends at the law offices of Bagley, McCann, and Linton <laughs> and discuss some Stock options as we look at the BYU football personnel and who you need to buy stock in right now. Maybe who are some of the off the radar guys among other topics. Okay, so Dave, my first question for you is as an expert, as an expert financially and in stock options and certainly in BYU football. Never been called two of the three, <laughs> so thank you. Which player's stock is the highest? of any BYU football player coming out of camp. You know, let's call it Apple stock in, in Jaron Hall. Yeah. And I haven't actually looked at Apple stock lately, but I know the last few years it's been crazy. Uh, everything that Jaron Hall has going for him is positive and the support around him and he's healthy. You know, we didn't see him in the bowl game uh, and he played with those banged up ribs for a good part of the season. Those ribs are healed and he's full go. He is, uh, he's at the top of the market. Yeah, and, and frankly, uh, Apple's set to release a new product early in September, so their stock remains high. That's a good pick. Jaron Hall, I love that comparison, is the Apple stock right now. It's just consistent. It's good. Yeah, it costs a lot, but it's worth it. And so I think I'm with you, and I think it needs to be the BYU quarterback. That's a good sign. Yeah, if we could have just got into Apple early. <laughs> We're into Hall early, but this might be his last year, so we just got to... We just got to ride the market yeah. with Jaron Hall. Yeah, you got to buy high and then hope that it just gets a little bit <laughs> better, right? And, and then you, you make some dividends on that. But we both agree Jaron Hall has the highest stock right now. It'll cost you, but it's worth every penny we think right now. So the next one is, well, okay, so that's, that's the standard up there. Who are you down here buying stock in that you think might – Rise. Okay, so I, I feel like we have a couple of uh, middling stock options, if you will. Yeah. And we're kind of in a wait-and-see mode. For me, the guy is Chris Brooks. Because we've heard from our friends at Cal, Roxy Bernstein of ESPN. He's a big Cal guy, a Cal grad. And he said, listen, you're getting a really good player, really good pass catcher as a running back. He's physical. He's never had a chance to run behind, like, a good offensive line. He hasn't been on a great football team. Now right. he's on what we think is a great top 25 football team. But we're still kind of waiting to see. Well, guess what? I'm taking that leap on Chris Brooks. Like, I'm all in. I, I am buying right now that middling stock option. I think that's going to rise for sure. Chris Brooks is my uh, guy that I feel like is going to have that significant stock rise in the first few weeks of the season. He, he's the guy I'm going with. How about you? He's looked good in camp, and he looks, he looks – uh, he's ripped and he's fast. We've watched him catch out of the backfield, and, and why not? I'm going to go with Keanu Hill. Ooh. A lot of the attention's on Puka and Gunner, justifiably okay. so. Okay. But here comes Hill. He had a decent season last year, made some big plays, showed some tenacity on when to cut and get downfield on a broken play, and when the ball's coming right to him, uh, there's a back shoulder toss. I love the size. I love the pedigree. He's from a football family. His dad caught a million footballs at Texas Tech. His uncle was a star at the Cowboys and the Texas Longhorns. It's in his pedigree. I think... While you're worried about Rex, Brooks, Nakua, and Romney, that here comes Keanu Hill in there. I'd buy stock. I'm buying stock in him. Ooh, I, li I like that pick too. Yeah, yeah Keanu Hill. And, and like you said, the, the catches he made, we just showed you a few of those. He made catches at pivotal moments, big plays. The touchdown catch against USC comes to mind as the most recent big catch he and made. Rarely is he double covered because they're too worried about everybody else. I love it. Yeah. I love that option. Okay. Now our third stock option, the bounce back stock. So you can go with uh, typically a guy that's been hampered by injuries or perhaps was redshirting. Just somebody that 
It's kind of off the radar. So your bounce back stock, Dave, who's the guy that you think is going to have a huge bounce back season? I scoured the roster, and uh, and I think it's going to be Jake Oldroyd. Okay, okay. Now, why the kicker and why Jake Oldroyd? Well, two years ago, he was 13 of 13. Last year, I think, I'm just going off my head, I think it was 9 of 13. But he had back issues, and um, he doesn't have those anymore. And a healthy Jake Oldroyd is a perfect Jay Coldroyd, for the most part, automatic on extra points, and uh, uh, you know you get in, you get on BYU's side of the fifty, and uh, you know two years ago when he was the Lou Groza runner-up, yes. he had three kicks of fifty or more, and they could have been longer. These aren't ones that just crawl over the bar. Great leg, his health is everything, and I, I, I he was good last year. He was great the year before. I think he's the bounce back stock of okay. when he comes in, that's money. It's guaranteed money. Guaranteed money. <laughs> guaranteed on your return, at least three points. He does have someone in his kicker's room with the name of Cash, Cash Peterman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Take the cash and invest in uh, <laughs> the kickers. Jake Oldroyd. Okay. My bounce back special is Keenan Peely. Keenan Peely is going to have, for lack of a better number, a million tackles this season, it feels like, Dave. He was all over the field early last year. How about 17 tackles in that Arizona game? Yes, amazing. And we're going to see more of that from Peely. He's healthy. He's back. We'll see more of those Arizona performances. The performance he had against Utah was really solid, and he was playing well until he got hurt against Arizona State. Keenan Peely is a difference maker for the entire BYU defense. He changes what BYU's defense is as a whole when he is locking up that middle linebacker position. If he stays healthy, Dave, his stock is low right now. He's, I mean, he had the significant injury. He's a guy I feel like could rise probably the most. From where he is starting yeah. to where he will finish, assuming health, he goes through a full slate. You watch out for Keenan Peely. He will be an NFL draft pick. So not just buying stock for the college football season. I'm buying stock on Keenan to get into the NFL as a draft pick as long as he can stay healthy. He's just, he changes the entire dynamic yeah. of that, uh, that defense, and uh, he allows the other guys around him now to go back into their natural positions. Keenan Peely's my guy. I'm going to sell a couple of my old droid shares and take that money and invest in Okay, it. okay. So now i got money in both camps. <laughs> uh, I, thought, I thought he brought such moxie to yeah. the defense, and when he went out, they lost that. They didn't have him for Baylor, and they didn't have him for Boise State during critical times yeah. of, can anybody stop these guys? And uh, who was the one guy they missed the most? Number 41. You want to talk about some areas that BYU's defense really struggled in last year? Third and short. Yeah. Had a terrible time getting off the field on third and three or fewer. What do you think would make a difference there? Maybe a, a star middle linebacker? Well, think about it. Arizona, Arizona State, and Utah, they weren't very good on third and short against BYU last year. Then Peely's out, and it's different. Yes. Everyone's moving around. He's the difference maker. So third and short, if, if you want help there, bring back Keenan Peely. And frankly, he makes the red zone defense a lot better too, and BYU had some of their some issues there as well. So right. I just really, really think that he's going to have a fantastic – bounce back season. Okay, now let's go with the long shot buy. Okay. Now, these are the stocks that, that no one's thinking about. All right. That might, you know, be, have big payoffs. Who are you going with? Okay, so in the wide receiver room, we, we've talked ad nauseum about how many different options Jaron Hall has. Okay, with Puka and Gunner and Keanu Hill, he's the guy that you, you like as a middling stock guy. Um, I'm going with somebody that I feel like has been consistent, has been there all camp, and it's just, he's just been down the depth chart. And so no one's really talking about him. But somebody from the secondary brought him up to me the other day and was like, you watch out. This guy deserves more respect. And it's Braden Cosper. Braden Cosper is my long play in the right. wide receiver room. It, we hear about Chase Roberts and Cody Epps. And yeah, those guys are awesome too. Braden Cosper has been quietly the most consistent wide receiver in fall camp. Okay, The most consistent. He's, his health is good. Why didn't we see him last year? Because he got hurt. He got hurt. Exactly right. Yeah. He got hurt, and then we saw the ascension of you know Puka and Gunner, and they kind of took over along with Keanu Hill. Right. Braden Cosper is going to have a bigger role this year. He's my long shot stock buy. Okay, uh, he he's the guy that's just been biding his time. He kind of reminds me of Dax Milne. He's got great hands. His strength is in precision footwork and the route running. Um, he he beats you in in places that uh, if you don't work as hard as him, he's going to have an advantage there. Like, he just will work harder than you, and that's how he beats you. Uh, he's got a great hand. Braden Cosper, who do you got? No one wants to hear mine, but I'm going to announce it anyway. Nobody? Because if it comes to fruition and I cash in on the stock, that means some things that happen that we don't want to see happen. <laughs> but I'm going to buy my long shot stock in uh, Jacob Conover, the backup quarterback. Hey, that stock's good next year too, Dave. It's good. Like, it's, oh, it's, it's, good? It's, it's good next year. Well, I was thinking of, you know, because we all want uh, instant payoff. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
I, I, Conover has had a, a, a good spring, and he's had a good summer, and we've watched him, and he's looked sharp. He's won the number two job uh, uh, in fall camp, and Cade Finnegan just a little bit behind, but th those two might battle for the starting job next year. But um, Jaron Hall's got a very physical schedule, and uh, BYU needs him to stay healthy to be successful. But in the event that he's not, Conover is ready to come in and utilize all the tools that will be out there on the field. Okay. It's not, oh, Hall's out, it's over because of my long shot stock. Okay. Because Conover can do the job. <laughs> we just want Jaron Hall to do the job in all, in all 12 games and the bowl game. But, you know, I'm putting stock in Conover okay. just as, a, as an emergency I like thing. It. I like it. May so let's say, let's say maybe there's uh, a few scrapes and bruises and, and Jaron's nicked up a little bit and you need – Jacob Conover to come in and take on an East Carolina or Wyoming or something. He can do that. Maybe he's the day trading, right? It's the day trading stock <laughs> option. Whoa, whoa, just for, just for the day. Let's just go. The, but prime time, we want to see number three back up. <laughs> yeah, for sure. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. The Cougar Whip Around presented by Marisk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. In the athletic, the top 131 teams are ranked in college football. Three teams ranked ahead of BYU. How many will still be ahead of BYU in the final rankings? Notre Dame 7, Baylor's 9, Oregon is 12. You know, I'd like to say that, that only one will be ranked higher than BYU, just based on the history of college football and like typically teams that are ranked high in the preseason, like one of those three is probably gonna be pretty good and stay up, up there somewhere. But it, I don't know, it's, I don't know, probably two, probably two of those three teams will be ranked ahead of BYU at the end of the season. Now, if BYU is only behind one of those teams, they've had a very, very special season, Dave. If you listen to Cam Miller, it's not gonna be Oregon. It's, he is not buying He's Oregon, not. but he is really, really high on Baylor yeah. and Notre Dame. Yeah. Yeah, good selections. I think uh, the Irish will, they open with Ohio State. Let's just, we'll find out real fast where, Ohio, where Notre Dame is in the uh, top 10. They may be booted, depending on what happens, they may be booted out and kept out. If they play them tough, national media always keeps them up high. Yep. And, and so then they'll be camped out there. They got Ohio State, their other big games, North Carolina, before they play BYU in Vegas. So we'll know a lot about Notre yeah. Dame. We think they'll take care of business other than Ohio State by the time they get to BYU. All right. BYU tweeted out a ranked graphic about three fall sports being ranked in the preseason for the first time since 1997. It's been 25 years. Awesome. BYU cross-country coach Ed Eyestone retweeted it and then added this. Hmm. We should probably check how long it's been since BYU's had five teams ranked in the top 25. Cross-country preseason polls coming out soon. We hear you, Ed. Dave, is this a very justified, hey, don't forget about us tweet? It seems like somebody wasn't at the meeting. <laughs> Both of those teams are going to be ranked. They'll be ranked. Uh, they are phenomenal. And uh, anyone seen a new Connor Mance on campus? You know, we'll be looking around on Monday, see if someone just popped in as school gets back. He'll be a tough replacement, but the men's and women's teams are primed for the Big 12 right now. Yeah, and, and we should point out, when we talked about this yesterday, like the three teams, we very quickly pointed out, hey, the cross-country yeah. teams will be ranked. So, like, BYU is going to have five ranked teams going into their respective fall seasons. And then and Coach Eystone was just like, yes, you're right. Yeah. Yes, you're right. And, and <laughs> they might be ranked the highest. That's the thing. We're talking <laughs> about, like, teams. We're talking about a team like, legitimately could win a national championship, the men and the women. Yeah. Like, that's the team. They'll be the top fives. And so, man, maybe they yes. just jump to the top of that graphic. Okay, with the rankings out of the way, Dave, we've all seen some weird food combinations creeping out on social media. This seems to be like a trend that's growing. We saw the hot dog uh, in a drinks uh, thing kind of take off over the weekend, which is, I can't believe people are still doing that, like using a hot dog as a straw. I watched that several times. I didn't understand it. Stop so it. First of all, get some ketchup and mustard on that hot dog. <laughs> and it's not a straw. Okay, well, these two have recently uh, been revealed. Would you rather partake of the cotton candy pickle burrito or the Oscar Mayer cold dog? It's a hot dog flavored frozen popsicle. That is disgusting. Dave, you gotta pick one. What are you picking? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going with the cold dog. Yeah, really? Yeah, 
Do you want a hot dog no popsicle? Way I'm eating that pickle burrito with uh, <laughs> sweet and sour or whatever. The cold dog, <laughs> we've all had cold hot dogs, let's be honest. <laughs> so they gross. They weren't great, but they got to be better than the cotton candy pickle burrito. <laughs> Unless I could pick off the cotton candy uh, and eat it and then leave everything else. It's absolutely what, what disgusting. What would you uh, do? I can't do a hot dog popsicle. I, I can't do it. I, I've tried to talk myself into it. I can't, I can't do it. So I will settle for the just slightly less disgusting cotton candy pickle. <laughs> you know Why what do you do this, people? Why? You know, you know what I'm not doing? I'm not buying stock in either one of those. Yeah. That wraps up the best of BYU Sports Nation this week. Tune in next Saturday for the Cougar news you need to hear. And catch the BYU Sports Nation simulcast every day at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific on BYU TV and BYU Radio.